Hi, it's Katrina. Burke and Hare Murder Dolls In 1836, a group of boys searching for rabbits in Scotland found a collection of 17 strange dolls in miniature coffins packed into a small cave in a hillside. Each creepy doll lay peacefully in its own coffin. But where did these dolls come from? Who made them, and why were they here hidden in the hillside? At first, people assumed that the dolls were related to witchcraft or were simply toys. During the 19th century, Edinburgh, Scotland was a leading center of anatomical study, but the skyrocketing demand for cadavers led to a shortage, and two men named William Burke and William Hare saw this as an opportunity to profit from death. Over a 10-month period in 1828, the pair sold 17 corpses to Robert Knox, an anatomist who dissected the bodies during his lectures. The first body belonged to a lodging tenant who passed away from edema. Once Hare and Burke realized how much money they could make per body, they murdered 16 people and split the profits. After they got caught, Hare received immunity for his testimony and was released from prison. Burke, on the other hand, was hanged for his crimes the following year. People began to believe that the dolls represented Burke and Hare Hare's victims. It looks like whoever made them came back several times over the years. Some had varying levels of decay, indicating that they were more exposed to weathering than others. All the dolls had their eyes open, and they all had black feet. The coffins were built first, and then the dolls were forced to fit into them, with some even having the arms removed in order to fit. Modern scientists attempted to determine if one of the killers created the dolls through DNA testing, which proved inconclusive. But it is generally accepted that the dolls have something to do with the murders with one theory suggesting that Burke had created them to assuage his guilty conscience. Eight of the dolls survive today and are on display at the National Museum of Scotland. Skin Book The Boston Athenaeum is one of the oldest libraries in the United States. Included among its collection of around 150,000 rare books is the handwritten memoir of a career criminal bound in his own skin. Born in 1809 under the given name James Allen, the character in question, who went by the alias George Walton, embarked on a life of crime starting at age 15 and became a career burglar. He spent his entire adult life in and out of prison and died from tuberculosis while behind bars in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Leading up to his death, Allen had a prison guard write down his life story and requested that two copies of the book be bound in his flesh. After he died, skin was removed from Allen's back, treated to look like gray deer skin, and sent to a bookbinder. One copy went to Allen's doctor, and the other went to John Fenno Jr., who, according to author Stephen Z. Nonak, was the only one of Allen's victims who ever stood up to him. Printed on its cover is the Latin phrase, Hic liber Waltonis cute compactus est, which translates to, This book was bound in Walton's skin. It's unknown how the Athenaeum acquired the book, but it's believed that John Fenno Jr.'s daughter donated it sometime during the 19th century. The practice of binding books with human skin, known as anthropodermic bibliopegy, may have started during the French Revolution. It was most popular among physicians who wrote medical texts. Would you read a book made from human skin? Let me know in the comments below. Schoolhouse Dungeon Located at 14 St. George Street near the city gate of St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest wooden schoolhouse is one of the oldest wooden schools in the United States. The one-room structure was originally a home that became a schoolhouse in 1716, according to tax records. Nobody knows exactly when it was built. It has a second floor where the live-in schoolmaster slept, as well as an outhouse and a detached kitchen. Students who misbehaved were sent to a small space beneath the stairs nicknamed the dungeon. In reality, it was most likely just a place for rambunctious children to regain their composure, but it serves as a sobering reminder of how vastly the education system has changed over the centuries. Today, the schoolhouse is a museum that remains mostly unchanged from the way it was hundreds of years ago. Visitors can see the dungeon for themselves, which contains the barefoot doll of a little boy sitting next to a pile of wood and holding a misspelled sign that says, I am innocent. At the doll's feet is another sign that says, unruly students were placed here for punishment. Please do not touch the unruly student. He bites. Creepy, right? As medieval as sending a young child to a punishment dungeon sounds, the school was progressive in some ways. In 1788, it became the first schoolhouse in the United States to hold co-ed classes. Cannibalistic Crew In 1845, two ships called the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus set sail for the Canadian Arctic in a quest to discover the Northwest Passage, a sea route connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans via the Arctic Ocean. Under the leadership of British Royal Navy officer and explorer, 
of Sir John Franklin, the expedition became trapped in ice, and all 129 crew members died after abandoning the ship. Their remains were discovered bit by bit over the next century and a half. Many of the bones contained cut marks, lending credibility to Inuit rumors that the perilously stranded men resorted to cannibalism in a desperate bid to survive. A 2016 study describes evidence of pot polishing, which happens when the ends of bones rub together in a pot of boiling water. Author Simon Mays and Owen Beatty pointed out that this was usually done at the end stages of cannibalism to extract marrow from the bones. This aligns with eyewitness reports from Inuits, who describe seeing piles of bones with cut marks in them that were characteristic of marrow extraction. Naturally, the mere thought of eating another human being is unspeakably disturbing to most people, but the decision to do so speaks to the level of desperation the men were experiencing, according to bioarchaeologist Anne Keenleyside, who spoke with Live Science. She posed the difficult question, you have to imagine yourself in that situation, what would you do? And while it's difficult to imagine, the plain and simple truth is that as humans, we don't know what lengths we'd go to to survive until we are put to that test. What do you think? What would you do? Let me know in the comments below. Wilson Castle Built in 1867 by a physician named John Johnson, a magnificent castle and its 18 outbuildings sit on a sprawling 115-acre parcel of land nestled in the heart of Vermont's Green Mountains. The beautiful three-story home contains 32 spacious rooms, 13 fireplaces, 84 stained glass windows, two turrets, and a balcony. Dr. Johnson and his wife only enjoyed the mansion for a short time before he could no longer afford the taxes and it was repossessed. The property went through four owners between the 1880s and 1939, when AM radio pioneer Herbert Lee Wilson bought it. Now named Wilson Castle, it has been the family's home for five generations. Part of the home is maintained by the Wilson Foundation, Inc., and is open to the public for tours. Situated in a remote area, the house appears seemingly out of nowhere and somewhat out of place. It only became a tourist attraction in recent years, with most people simply regarding it as an insignificant oddity, given its lack of famous residents over the years, according to Andy Propst, a friend of the Wilson family who spoke with the news. But its eerie overtones have attracted the curiosities of those interested in the paranormal, who suspect that the Wilson Castle may be haunted. People that have gone reported footsteps and a creepy vibe, but ghost hunters have not found anyone that has died in the house. Yet. Gerbil Tooth Headdress Discovered in 2018, the Lothagam North Pillar site is a 5,000-year-old burial site in Kenya. It's situated in a sprawling field and consists of burial mounds and pillars that took anywhere from 450 to 900 years to build. At the center of the site is a stone platform measuring 100 feet in diameter that contains a burial chamber that may have once held the remains of up to 580 people. The seemingly uneventful 15,000-square-foot site is not dedicated to royals or elites, but instead contains the graves of ordinary ordinary tribe members of all ages and genders, who were indiscriminately laid to rest side by side. Nobody was given preferential treatment, and most bodies were adorned with colorful jewelry. Included among these discoveries is a headdress made of 405 gerbil teeth that came from 100 individual gerbils. Because gerbils were not domesticated yet, this means that whoever created the headdress had to go through the painstaking process of trapping the animals. Built at a time when decreased rainfall caused shorelines to retreat, the graveyard represents a shift in cultural expression that went along with the environmental changes that were going on, according to researchers. A fresh look at the Lothagam North Pillar site is offering experts fresh insight into the emergence of complex societies and the new social rituals that came along with it, including monuments to the dead. Neanderthal Cannibals As the Neanderthals approached the end of their existence around 40,000 years ago, a group of our ancient cousins feasted on six members of the same species in a cave in the Ardennes Forest in Goyette, Belgium. The victims consisted of a newborn, a young child, and four adults or teenagers. According to a 2016 study, their remains bear cut marks, pits, and notches, suggesting that they were deliberately butchered and that their killers made tools from their bones. By all appearances, the butchers were thorough in skinning and cutting up their victims and in extracting their bone marrow. Archaeologist Christian Casellas described the evidence of cannibalism as irrefutable. These findings build on previous evidence of Neanderthal cannibalism found in Spain and France, 
First occupied during the Paleolithic era, the caves at Goyette were first explored during the 19th century by geologist and paleontologist Edward Dupont, who collected a large collection of bones and tools. But his published findings went largely unnoticed until 2004, when Patrick Simal, the head of anthropology at the Brussels Institute of Natural Sciences, noticed a Neanderthal jawbone in Dupont's collection that had been mistaken for an animal bone. This prompted further exploration of the site, which proved the sneaking suspicion that Neanderthals not only lived and ate there, but that they sometimes preyed on their own species. The Neanderthals' known history of cannibalism dates back to 120,000 years ago, when climate change eradicated many of the animals they relied on for food. Evidence found in France shows a distinct change from eating large mammals like bison and reindeer to smaller creatures like snakes and rodents, as well as other Neanderthals. This shows that food was running out and that the Neanderthals were eating merely to survive. But this does not explain every instance of Neanderthal cannibalism, and scientists are still working to untangle the mysteries behind why these early humans decided to eat each other. Highgate Cemetery In response to a growing demand for centrally located land to develop and concerns over the spread of disease, the City of London created its first municipal cemetery, known as the Magnificent Seven during the 1830s. One of them, called Highgate Cemetery, has a reputation for being the city's creepiest graveyard. The site was a popular burial ground for some time. Around 170,000 people were buried here, including Karl Marx, sci-fi author Douglas Adams, and famous criminal Adam Worth, who is thought to have inspired the character Professor Moriarty, Sherlock Holmes's nemesis. But Highgate's popularity waned over time, and by the end of World War II, the cemetery was overgrown and in disrepair. During the 1970s, filmmakers used the site as a shooting location for horror films, sparking a renewed public interest in the property. Soon enough, tales of grave robbers, vampires, and destruction at Highgate began appearing in news headlines. This time period, known as the Highgate Vampire Sensation, came with rumors that visitors witnessed an unidentified creature hovering over the graves according to a book titled Beyond the Grave, which claims that vampire hunters flock to the site to break open tombs and mutilate bodies. A neighbor who lived next door to the cemetery reportedly claimed that they discovered a headless body behind the wheel of a parked car one morning. The urban legends surrounding Highgate became so problematic police had to lock and guard the graveyard, and it didn't stop vampire hunters from scaling the walls and gates to get inside. Things have quieted down since then, and the site is now overseen by staff and mostly limited to guided tours. But the cemetery remains as creepy as ever, and photography is extremely restricted, making one wonder what they might see there that they're not allowed to capture with their video camera. Coffin Birth and Brain Surgery Around 1,300 years ago, a pregnant woman died weeks before she was due to have her baby in the medieval town of Imola, Italy. Archaeologists found her buried with a hole in her skull and a collection of small bones beneath her pelvis. In a phenomenon known as a coffin birth, posthumous gases had pushed the corpse out of the woman's body. Discoveries like this are incredibly rare in archaeology. A 2018 study examining the remains determined that the hole in her skull was likely from trepanation, a primitive brain surgery technique that involved drilling into a patient's head to release the pressure. It was used to treat numerous ailments that cause brain swelling, but apparently did little to help the woman. The researchers wrote that they believe she experienced one of two high blood pressure pressure conditions that can happen during pregnancy, known as preeclampsia and eclampsia. In a last-ditch effort to save her life, her caretakers performed trepanation, but their efforts were unfortunately in vain. Experts can admittedly only speculate about the reasons for the brain surgery, since this discovery is unique in terms of the time and place it occurred. While signs of trepanation have been found in some 1,500 skulls dating back to the Neolithic period, this is a first for a medieval burial in Italy. Because of how precise the hole is, it was unlikely caused by violence, according to the study. Signs of healing indicate that the procedure was done at least a week before she died. Discovered in 2010, the remains date back to sometime during the 7th or 8th centuries, known as the Lombard period. She died in her 20s or 30s and was near full term in her pregnancy at 38 weeks. Abba Yohani In the Tigray region of Ethiopia, there is a mysterious monastery built into the side of a mountain that dates back to the 4th century. It's known as the Abba Yohani Monastery, and it was originally constructed by the powerful Aksum dynasty. Nobody is really sure why the Ethiopians built so many churches into the sides of mountains, literally carved right out of the rock. 
Some claim they were built after Queen Yorid Gurit tried to eradicate Christianity from the region. To save the churches from those who wished to quash Christianity, the churches were built in places where they couldn't be spotted, and they were made out of pure stone so that they could never be burned to the ground. What's truly amazing is just how difficult it is to reach the church. Thousands of years ago, worshippers would have had to literally scale the side of the mountain like a rock-climbing goat just to reach the interior of the church. Building the church alone would have been a dangerous nightmare, with workers clinging to the side of the mountain with a sheer drop just underneath their feet. One slip would have meant certain death. People still make the pilgrimage up the side of this mountain even today. The church still performs services such as baptisms. Those who wish to visit the mysterious church of Abba Yohani or to get their child baptized must do so barefoot, otherwise they risk slipping and tumbling down to the desert floor below. The Creatures of Mount Nyangani Mount Nyangani in Zimbabwe has a chilling nickname, the Swallowing Mountain. It gained its name because of how often people disappear while climbing it. According to local tradition, Mount Nyangani is a sacred mountain inhabited by ancestral spirits. It's also said to be haunted by evil spirits and other supernatural creatures. Locals warn that if travelers come across a colorful snake, a pot with no fire, or a brick of gold, then it's best to ignore those things and move on. Also, mischievous spirits are said to push people off ledges. Visitors often report feeling dizzy, disoriented, and nauseous. They also report strange sounds, lights, animals that follow them, and trees that twist into human faces and whisper. There are even rumors of streams that turn blood red. In November 2014, 20-year-old British explorer Thomas Gaysford set out alone to explore the mountain. He intended to reach the summit that day and stay overnight. Later, he claimed a thick fog descended during the climb, which made him disoriented. Heavy rain began to pour. He decided to camp where he was and wait for the weather to clear. In the surrounding darkness, various creatures appeared to circle him. This gave credence to warnings from locals, who told him to ignore any strangely behaving animals. Gaysford waited 10 hours for the fog to clear. When it did, he left the mountain as fast as he could. Others, however, discount his story and say he was dehydrated and he had a big imagination. Kennecott Ghost Town The Kennecott Ghost Town, located far in the mountainous wilderness of Alaska, is one of the most mysterious and haunting places anywhere on the planet. It may not have archaeological significance, but it's certainly a place you wouldn't want to visit alone, and definitely not at night. The spooky mine can be found in the heart of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. It's one of the last historical sites from Alaska's mining era. Since the 1950s, not a soul has lived in Kennecott, and there have been rumors that it's rich in supernatural and paranormal activity. Before you go, keep in mind that there have been many witnesses reporting ghostly activity, including apparitions. People say things move in broad daylight and that they feel an overwhelming sense of unease and dread while exploring the property. Nobody knows if Kennecott is truly haunted, but it definitely feels like it. This creepy town was once a flourishing mine, filled with happy workers trying to get rich by working in the mines. There was a train, businesses, shops, and everything was going pretty swell. But then, in 1938, the town was mysteriously abandoned overnight by its citizens. Most of them left their belongings in their houses and simply walked away, probably because the mine had shut down. Just wanted to give a big shout out to Anthony and Allison Green and Jeremy Wilson. Thanks so much for joining us in our little corner of the internet. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe before you leave so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Kropfenstein Castle Kropfenstein Castle is one of the most mysterious castles anywhere in Europe. It's located in Switzerland and considered a heritage site of national significance. However, there are absolutely no records that indicate when, how, or why the castle was built. Judging by its appearance, it was probably constructed sometime during the 13th century. It was in the 14th century when the Counts of Kropfenstein appeared in historical records. Some people believe they took up the name of the castle after moving into it, but who actually built the castle is still a mystery. What's truly amazing is that the castle was carved out of the side of a mountain, perfect for protection and defense. It's literally jutting out from the side of a cliff, which has helped it to remain in such good condition over the centuries, since it's shielded from the weather. It was once three stories tall but has decayed a bit over the years. The interior is empty and full of rubble, and the roof has long since caved in. 
The counts of Kropfenstein died out in the 15th century, everyone who was part of the bloodline was lost, and the castle eventually fell into disrepair. It can still be seen today, though it's nearly invisible on the side of the mountain. You can't even see it from a distance unless you know what you're looking for. The only way to get there is by a precarious trail along the edge of the cliff, coming from the dense forest. The Valley of Headless Men This doesn't sound good at all. Nahani National Park is part of the Mackenzie Mountains region in Canada. Despite its pristine, idyllic appearance, the park earned the name Valley of Headless Men for very good and sinister reasons. Natives that settled in the area feared the valley because they thought it was evil and refused to live there. To this day, there are tons of rumors of UFOs, disappearances, and strange cryptids, including Bigfoot. According to legend, the only people to actually settle in the valley instead of around it were the violent Naha tribe, which allegedly consisted of deadly warriors who wore masks and armor. They wielded strange weapons and were larger than normal men. They loved to decapitate their victims, hence the spooky name of the valley. Where are the Naha tribe now? Nobody knows. They supposedly vanished without a trace, although it's possible they still live there because the park is largely unexplored. In 1908, Willie and Frank McLeod, lured by stories of gold nuggets the size of grapes, went prospecting in the valley. For a year, no one saw them again until their decapitated bodies were found along the river. Their heads were never found. Nine years later, another miner named Martin Jorgensen tried his luck. He built a cabin and started a small mining operation. Then his cabin burned down, and his headless charred corpse was found amongst the ruins. By 1969, 44 people had vanished in the valley. Today, only adventurous rafters and kayakers traverse the valley, and it can only be reached by plane or boat. The strangeness hasn't stopped, as visitors often report strange lights and mysterious ape-like creatures strolling through the trees. Who's up for camping? Long Men Grottoes The Long Men Grottoes are a collection of over 2,300 caves carved into the limestone cliffs above the Yi River in China's Henan Province. This incredible site is chock full of carvings, statues, and inscriptions. According to UNESCO World Heritage, the grottoes contain the most impressive collection of Chinese art from between 316 and 907 during the Northern Wei and Tang dynasties. Many of the works inside the caves are devoted to Buddha, built over the centuries with artistic styles changing from cave to cave. It was a time when the Buddhist religion had great influence over the various kingdoms of China, and many leaders used it as a way to assert authority. The Wei dynasty was considered to be made up of barbaric foreigners by the Han Chinese. The Wei emperor decided to move the capital to Luoyang, but many of the elite class did not like this decision including one of the emperor's sons who was forced to kill himself for going against his father. The emperor got things under control and construction began on monasteries and temples, including in the caves. During the Tang Dynasty, it was the golden age of China, and Buddhism spread along with people who traveled all across the region for pilgrimage. Now, there are 110,000 Buddhist statues carved from stone, over 60 stupas, and at least 2,800 inscriptions. Other relief carvings commemorate historic events such as the crowning of an empress or the founding of a new city. The incredible carvings and sculptures give the area a very deep spiritual significance. Doomsday Cult In a remote part of Philadelphia, there is a Doomsday Cult hideaway hidden in the hills and forests. The entranceway to the cult's hideout is little more than a doorway carved into the side of a huge hill. Beyond the doorway is a place where a group of people used to meet while they waited for the end of days and for the second coming of Jesus Christ. This was one of the first doomsday cults in America. It wasn't recent, so you may not have heard of it. The cult originated in 1694, when a group of German mystics and monks settled near the Wissahickon Creek in Philadelphia. According to Ripley's Believe It or Not, they called themselves the Society of the Woman in the Wilderness. They got the inspiration for their name from a woman in the Book of Revelations, who searched for refuge deep in the wilderness during the final days of the apocalypse. The cult's cave-like hideaway was chosen because of its closeness to clean spring water, and because it is located on the 40th parallel, and the number 40 held a special significance to the monks. These people became hermits and lived in the cave for over a decade. They were led by Johann Kelpius from Transylvania, a mystic and scholar who had actually been born in the same small village as Vlad the Impaler, aka Dracula. But alas, their place in the woods didn't last long. 
the monks eventually disbanded in 1708 after their leader died and the apocalypse never happened. Some ex-members went on to become doctors and lawyers, but the cave can still be found today and it's still just as creepy and mysterious as it was in the 1600s. Elkmont Ghost Town The Smoky Mountains is the place to go if you're looking for mystery and the paranormal. And while there are many sites throughout the Smoky Mountains that inspire horror and intrigue, there is one place in particular that is pretty spooky. It's called Elkmont, and it's a mysterious ghost town that is surrounded by stories. Elkmont was once a prosperous logging camp and a resort town high in the mountains where wealthy people would go to relax. However, the community eventually fell apart. It was settled in the 1840s, and 90 years later, in 1934, when the logging was finished and the government decided to turn the area into a national park, the residents were forced to decide whether to relocate immediately and sell their houses at full price or sell their houses and properties to the National Park Service at a lower price, but still get to stay inside their homes until 1992. In the end, the park had roughly 70 buildings without anyone to maintain them. The cabins began to deteriorate, the place turned into a ghost town, and today it is said to be riddled with the ghosts of those early settlers, as well as everyone else who's gone missing in the area since. During the day, it's not so bad, but at night is when the goblins come out. If you see a lost soul, it might be Daddy Bryson and Charles Jenkins, two men driving a train that crashed. Or it could be a woman riding a horse said to be looking for her dead husband's head. You just never know. Neanderthal Flower Burial Far in the Zagros Mountains of northern Iraq, there is a mysterious cave that once sheltered a small group of Neanderthals. This was several tens of thousands of years ago, with their bodies being discovered in the 1950s. Nobody knows exactly what these Neanderthals were up to, other than simply seeking shelter. But some of them had been buried in the cave. One of the skeletons was found with injuries that suggest he would have needed to be taken care of for the rest of his life. Perhaps this is the beginning of civilization. Someone, most likely family members, stayed in the cave helping to take care of this early human until he eventually died. And then, after his death, scientists believe his body was covered in flowers. According to Ralph Solecki, who had helped in excavating the bodies, the skeleton was found dusted in pollen. The logical explanation is that after the crippled Neanderthal passed on, he was buried in a shallow grave inside the cave and then decorated with local flowers. The reason this is so interesting is that most anthropologists believe Neanderthals never buried their dead, but maybe ate them or just abandoned them wherever. Burying a body and leaving flower offerings raises many questions about when early people began to bury their dead and what they believed in. The Ruenzori Mountains The Ruenzori Mountains are one of the most mysteriously alluring places in the world. There is no one particular place within the mountains that's mysterious. It's the whole region that's spooky and even mystical. The mountains are often draped in fog, it rains all the time, and they were first named by the Greeks back in 150 AD as the Mountains of the Moon. This is the only mountain range along the equatorial belt in Africa that has glaciers and ice caps. It was also only confirmed during modern times by the British explorer Henry Morton Stanley back in 1888 when he spotted the snowy peaks during a brief moment that the clouds went away. For years, explorers tried climbing into the mountains and they failed every single time. The highest peak wasn't climbed successfully until 1906. It wasn't until much later that any actual international exploring was done, beginning in the 1930s, but not picking up until the 1980s. One of the big issues has been that the mysterious mountains are often filled with guerrilla soldiers and rebel forces from the Congo. Perhaps the coolest part about the Renzori Mountains is just how little they've been explored and how hard it is to do so. What this means is that there are probably hundreds, even thousands of species that have never been identified living in the mist. Citadel La Ferrière Located on Haiti's northern coast, the Citadel is a very imposing fortress that sits on top of a mountain 3,500 feet high. It is steeped in scandal and superstition, but it is so impressive that some even call it the eighth wonder of the world. Built in the early 19th century by a general named Henry Christophe, it is a universal symbol of liberty, since it is one of the first monuments constructed by former black slaves who had fought for their freedom and independence. After 14 years of fighting, the leader of the revolution, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, declared that the Republic of Haiti was now independent. After the death of Dessalines, Henri Christophe declared himself king. Just because they were independent didn't mean that things were peaceful.
The structure is the largest fortress in the Americas, made up of four buildings that are protected by four enormous towers. It was designed to provide living space, storage space, and water supply for up to 5,000 people for up to a year. Its location on high ground was strategically chosen to make it difficult for enemies to attack, and the citadel was designed with the same concept in mind, with steep sides that drop off directly into the mountainside, and a triangular front wall jutting out towards the road, limiting the view of the structure's profile. It took 20,000 former slaves around 15 years to complete the fortress, with rumors saying that the work was so difficult, half of them died in the process. King Christophe built an enormous palace for himself and lived there until he died. During his reign, he would line up a few of his soldiers and make them march over the edge of the citadel, plunging to their death just to show how brave they were. The fortress was built to defend Haiti against a forceful return of French forces, but this never happened, and its 365 cannons were therefore never put to use. Now you can visit the fortress for yourself, and maybe even catch a glimpse of mad King Henry Christophe lurking through the hallways. While the view of the surrounding landscape and the coast down below is nothing short of amazing, the fortress also carries eerie overtones, leading one visitor to describe it as one of the most awe-inspiring yet creepy places I've ever been. Church Hill Tunnel Built in 1873, the Church Hill Tunnel is a sealed train tunnel beneath Jefferson Park in Richmond, Virginia, that looks like it was doomed from the start. It was already considered obsolete by the time it was abandoned in 1902. The city of Richmond attempted to restore the 4,000-foot-long tunnel in 1925, but a huge section of it collapsed during construction as a 10-car locomotive passed through. At least two workers died, while some managed to escape and survive. Legend has it that the workers had reawakened an ancient vampire who lived inside the tunnel and who caused it to collapse as revenge against the workers for disturbing him. Survivors of the tunnel collapse allegedly discovered the vampire crouching over one of the victims and baring his bloody, jagged teeth. In another version, there was just one survivor, and after the tunnel collapsed, a vampire emerged to the surface with skin hanging from his body, also with jagged teeth. The bloody creature made a run for it towards the river. Witnesses said they chased it, but it disappeared. Over the years, several attempts were made to recover the locomotive and the two bodies, but were impeded each time by sinkholes and additional collapses. The tunnel was eventually sealed off with sand and concrete, and it remains the final resting place of the train and the workers. Throughout the tunnel's lifespan, at least nine people lost their lives to similar circumstances as the two men who were supposedly victimized by the vampire. Scientists say it's unlikely that supernatural forces of any type are at play, but that people died because the tunnel was built among clay and soft sandstone and was therefore not structurally sound. Leamington Spa Station Considered one of Britain's most haunted buildings, Leamington Spa Station was built in the 1880s. For years, staff and commuters alike have reported paranormal sightings and activity. In 2014, a worker claimed to witness an invisible force slamming doors, turning lights on and off, and throwing paperwork around. The disturbing activity reached a point where Chiltern Railways hired a supernatural liaison officer to watch out for ghosts on the platforms and in the station. In 2016, journalist Chloe Mason spoke with the supernatural liaison officer Nick Rees, who told her that the ghosts were mostly friendly and had good energy, and that he was accustomed to hearing footsteps at the site. One of the creepiest parts of the property is an abandoned basement on one of the platforms, which contains a partially sealed off staircase leading to nowhere. One staff member told Mason that they had seen doors slam out of nowhere, and a night patrolman described Leamington Spa Station as one of the most haunted places out of many that he has been to in his lifetime. Hotel del Salto This beautiful hotel is also known for tragedy. Located in San Antonio del Tequendama, Colombia, the Hotel del Salto was originally built as an upscale residence for architect Carlos Arturo Tapias in 1923. Also called the Mansion of Tequendama Falls, it features high windows and luxurious French architecture, reflecting the style of society's elite at the time. The building became a hotel for wealthy travelers in 1928 so that people could visit the falls, and it remained in business for the next 60 or so years. 
Plans to rebuild an 18-story structure in the Hotel del Saltos Place never came to be. And over the years, the original structure fell into disrepair. And rumors spread that perhaps the place was haunted and the water was contaminated. After the hotel closed and was abandoned during the 1990s, it gained notoriety for the number of suicides that had allegedly happened there over the years. Consequently, the property gained a reputation for being haunted. Local legend holds that the indigenous Muisca people jumped from the top of the falls when the Spanish conquered the area, choosing to end their own lives rather than become slaves. When they fell, they would transform into an eagle and fly to freedom. In modern times, the story attracted other sad souls who would leap off the cliffs. Today, researchers are hoping to change the site's reputation and turn it into a museum as a symbol of cultural heritage and biodiversity. Have you ever visited somewhere haunted? Did you see anything scary? Let me know in the comments below. And I wanted to give a big shout out to William Egan and Silent Watch. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Room 873 Known for being one of Canada's most beautiful hotels, the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel in Alberta was built in 1888 as a luxury retreat for wealthy travelers. Nestled among the Canadian Rockies, it's hosted numerous famous visitors, including Marilyn Monroe, Helen Keller, and Queen Elizabeth II. But the hotel has a dark side despite its grandeur and prestige. Rumor has it that it even inspired Stephen King's The Shining. According to legend, a man murdered his wife and daughter before committing suicide in room 873. Guests who stayed in the room after the tragedy reported terrifying paranormal encounters, including blood-curdling screams in the middle of the night, lights turning on and off by themselves, and bloody fingerprints on the bathroom mirror. The hotel supposedly closed off the room in an attempt to stop the ongoing horror, leaving adventurous modern-day guests without the option to stay in room 873. Employees chalk these claims up to being nothing more than a fantastical ghost story and say that the murder-suicide never happened. But the hotel's eighth floor is the only level with no rooms ending in 73. In the area where room 873 would be, guests have noticed that there's a baseboard missing where a door would have been and an unusually large gap between rooms 871 and 875. Above the missing baseboard, there is a lamp like the ones that hang over the doors to other rooms, except there is no door. Project engineer writer Bernie Rosecki noticed on the hotel's floor plan that the area that would normally contain room 873 is encompassed by room 875, which is larger than the other rooms on the floor. He asked the concierge about this, and the employee explained in what Rosecki called a well-trained response that the two rooms were combined during a renovation. How convenient! Many people do not buy the hotel's official position that the murder-suicide story is a hoax. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. New Bedford Orpheum Theater The Orpheum Theater opened in New Bedford, Massachusetts on April 15, 1912, the same day the Titanic sank. Originally named the Majestic Opera House, it seated an audience of 1,500 and was designed to include a ballroom, a shooting range, retail space, a gym, and more. During the 1920s, it began featuring motion pictures. It's believed that the Orpheum Theater is among the oldest in the nation, second only to the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles. The New Bedford Orpheum closed sometime in 1958 or 59 and was only used for special occasions. In 1962, the French Sharpshooters Club sold it to a tobacco company that used it for storage. Today, the building is privately owned by the nonprofit Orpheum Rising Project Helpers, which is dedicated to restoring the theater, but so far it remains empty. Many believe that it's haunted, but it's hard to say what exactly goes on there. Another haunted place in Bedford is the New Bedford Armory. The National Guard asked the Ghost Hunters team to come and debunk claims that the armory was haunted. The team went in to spend the night, and around midnight the sound man was suddenly knocked to the ground. He said he felt cold and that something grabbed him. He apparently quit after the episode. This town has a lot of ghosts and spirits roaming around. Eastern State Penitentiary Located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Eastern State Penitentiary, or ESP, is a former prison that some consider to be the most haunted correctional facility in the United States. 
During its operating years from 1829 to 1971, it became infamous for its use of solitary confinement and housed some of history's most notorious criminals, including Al Capone and bank robber Willie Sutton. The prison went down in history for a slew of terrible things, including suicide, murder, insanity, disease, and torture. Inmates endured unimaginably harsh punishments, including something called the water bath, which involved being submerged in water and left in the winter cold until ice formed on their bodies. Prisoners were also tightly bound to the mad chair, cutting off their circulation to the point where amputations were sometimes necessary. There was also the iron gag, which involved tying an inmate's hands behind their back and forcing them to wear an iron collar that would tear their tongue and mouth and cause them to bleed if they tried to move. Perhaps the worst punishment inflicted upon prisoners was the hole, a pitch-dark underground cell that took sensory deprivation to a whole new level, affording no human contact, no toilet, and little food and air to the unfortunate soul locked inside. The prison scaled back on solitary confinement in 1913 due to overcrowding and ultimately closed in 1971. Ever since, it's been a popular attraction among history and paranormal enthusiasts alike, since so many horrible things happened here. Stories of hauntings date back to the 1940s and bear eerie similarities, with certain parts of the prison being known for specific supernatural activities. In cell block 12, for example, visitors, staff, and inmates have all reported hearing echoing voices and laughing, while ghostly faces are known to grace the halls of cell block 4. Stories of other strange sights and sounds abound. Tour guides are not so quick to label the site as haunted, as Ben Bookman told NPR, explaining that they do not want to exploit the prison's dark image and pointing out that the prisoners who suffered there were real people and that it's important not to make fun of or glorify their experiences. The Queen Mary The RMS Queen Mary is a retired British ocean liner that is permanently docked in Long Beach, California. From 1936 to 1967, the vessel carried some 2.2 million passengers across the Atlantic from Europe to North America with the exception of its years of service as a troop ship during World War II. The ship boasted five dining areas and lounges, two cocktail bars, two swimming pools, a grand ballroom, a squash court, and a small hospital. Today, the vessel is a floating hotel and haunted attraction with three restaurants and a wedding hall. Guests at the hotel experienced the opportunity to not only be surrounded by the original wood paneling and portholes, but to perhaps encounter one of the ship's long-gone passengers in ghost form. In 2008, Time magazine included the Queen Mary on its top 10 haunted places list, which describes the ghost of a sailor who died in the ship's engine room, children who drowned in the pool, and a woman known as the Lady in White. Guests who dare and who are willing to shell out a pretty penny can stay in the vessel's most haunted rooms, including stateroom B340, where a man died of unknown causes in 1948. Ever since, passengers and staff alike have experienced apparitions of a man who disappears into thin air, the bed covers being suddenly pulled off by an invisible force, strange knocking on the door at night, and the bathroom sink left running despite no recent guests staying in the room. There is also the Mauritania Room, where three maids watched a woman vanish before their eyes in 1989 the pool where people have seen a woman in a tennis skirt disappear, as well as a lady in an old-fashioned wedding gown standing next to a little boy in a suit. These are just some of the paranormal hotspots on the Queen Mary, where it seems like there is a ghost around every corner. Dragsholm Castle Nestled among meadows and lakes on the Danish island of Zealand, Dragsholm Castle was built as a palace in 1215 by the Bishop of Roskilde. It's one of Denmark's oldest secular buildings. During the Middle Ages, the structure was converted into a fortified castle. Then it was seized by the crown as part of the Reformation, and from 1536 to 1664, it served as a prison for nobility and clergy members. The castle changed hands several times after that, and was even restored after an attempt was made to destroy it. There are said to be over 100 ghosts lurking throughout Drag's home slot. One of them is James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell and the third husband to marry Queen of Scots. He was imprisoned at the castle in 1573 and was fed just enough food and water to stay alive, according to legend. He went insane and died sometime between 1576 and 1578. Modern-day visitors have reported seeing him ride into the courtyard on his horse. 
Another ghost, known as the White Lady, was imprisoned by her own father in one of the castle's dungeons after becoming pregnant by a commoner. People have reported seeing a woman in a white dress wandering the castle at night in search of her long-lost lover and occasionally moaning in sorrow. If you dare to step foot inside the castle, who knows who else you might find. Pyramid of Senusret II The mud brick pyramid of Lahun in Egypt is opening for the first time to the public. While the pyramid is located only about 60 miles southwest of Cairo, it can almost be confused with a mountain because time and the elements are slowly making it disappear before our eyes. It's often called the disappearing pyramid because it doesn't even really look like one anymore. Right now, this ancient pyramid looks more like a random piece of rock sticking out of the desert. If you were to walk past the pyramid, you might not even think to stop and look. But despite the fact that the Pyramid of Senusret II seems to be slowly fading, it is truly an ancient and mysterious location. Discovered in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 2000s that archaeologists were able to perform serious excavations. Inside, researchers found a collection of mummies and brightly colored coffins. This little-known pyramid dates back to the 12th dynasty of the pharaohs, built during the reign of Senusret II, who ruled Egypt from 1897 BC to 1878 BC. It actually took researchers months to find the entrance into the pyramid back in the 1840s because there was no entrance. The only way into the pyramid was through a corridor, a very narrow entrance shaft found a few yards away from the pyramid underneath the tomb of a mysterious princess. This strange design was likely to keep away grave diggers and tomb raiders. After all, the Egyptians had had a lot of experience at this point creating tombs and pyramids and knew what they were doing. In more recent years, Egyptian officials have performed extensive conservation and preservation work to protect the ancient pyramid, including clearing out rocks and debris from the tunnels and tombs and installing stairs and lights so visitors can come and enjoy it before it is forgotten completely. Prehistoric Telephone When you hear of a telephone, you probably think it's a modern invention. But what if I told you an ancient telephone was found that dates back over 1,000 years? Sounds almost like a hoax, right? A very real marvel from an ancient society in South America was recently discovered by archaeologists, who claim it may be the first telephone ever invented. The invention in question was reportedly found inside the famous Chan Chan ruins of Peru. According to experts, it is the oldest known communication device and the earliest physical evidence of telephone technology anywhere in the Americas. But who built this telephone and why? It was an unbelievable innovation that came from the coastal Chimu people who once ruled the Rio Moche Valley in the north of Peru. These people actually predate the Inca and may have been even more advanced than the builders of Machu Picchu. After all, they did invent the telephone. How was it made? It's almost like an old string telephone. But instead of tin cans connected by a string, the Chimu device was built out of two gourd tops and a long length of cord. The gourds acted as transmitters and receivers, while the cord, which stretched over 75 feet and was made of cotton twine, worked to send the voice from one end to the other. Even more fascinating is that according to the curator of the National Museum of the American Indian, this is the only telephone or communication device that has been found at the site. Did they have more? Was this common or was this a one-time thing? It's incredible to think that the Chimu people created the telephone because historians used to think they were not that advanced since they didn't have a written language. Turns out, they had a lot more going on. Painted Bones The bones of a mysterious woman have been discovered in Ukraine. The discovery comes from the Dniester River, where there are dozens of burial mounds bursting with the skeletons of ancient humans. One of the most recently discovered skeletons to be excavated is that of a woman who appeared to have her bones painted after she died over 4,500 years ago. The truth of why her bones were painted is something of an archaeological mystery. It all started when archaeologists in Ukraine excavated 61 people from four underground necropolises. The oldest tomb goes back about 5,500 years. The team of archaeologists were investigating the area to see if it was an important location for cultural exchange throughout the centuries. What they found was that most of the skeletons could be traced back to the Yamnaya culture, also sometimes known as the pit culture because they were so fond of burying people inside large pits. Not much is known about the Yamnaya culture. This is why archaeologists were taking such a close look at the bones. They were trying to analyze them to learn more about their lives, and that was when they came across the painted bones of the mysterious woman. 
It was the first such instance researchers had seen such decoration on human remains from this specific culture. It is now believed that she was likely a very important member of the community. At some point, her tomb had been reopened. Someone decorated her bones and painted them, then they sealed her tomb back up. But right now, researchers can't understand why. Inca Cemetery At an ancient Inca cemetery in Ecuador, some very strange and mysterious artifacts have been found. It all began when workers started building an irrigation water tank. But almost immediately after the digging started, builders found ancient human remains. An archaeological team was brought in, and they revealed that they were skeletons of people who lived about 500 years ago. But along with the skeletons were strange artifacts that have led to more questions than answers. The ancient Inca cemetery was found in the rural district of Mulalo. A total of 12 skeletons belonging to both adults and children were taken from the graves. But according to Esteban Acosta, the archaeologist in charge of the excavations, the teeth of the dead were in shockingly good condition. Genetic analysis of the teeth will soon tell researchers if the people buried here were all related as a family unit. Right now, everyone is pretty sure these remains belong to ancient Inca people. This is because of the classic Inca pottery found within the graves. But some of the ceramics stand out because of strange symbols drawn on them. Some of them have giant W letters drawn, and researchers don't know why. They don't know if it signifies a name or a place, or if it's just decorative. Another mysterious artifact was a ring found on one of the skeletons that archaeologists say isn't made out of any known metal and doesn't appear to be associated with the Inca culture at all. Nobody can say what the ring signifies or where it even came from. The English Giant There is an English giant etched into the side of a hilltop in England. This isn't a new discovery as the Cern Abbas Giant, as he's called, has been around for a very long time and all the locals know he's there. However, New information from archaeologists is suggesting that the giant figure who has been dominating the English countryside and Dorset for centuries may have been based on an ancient and very naked god. Until recently, experts thought the giant was drawn in the Roman days, probably between the year 43 and 410. But recent evidence says the giant was actually carved much more recently, probably in the 10th century. The reason nobody can quite agree on this is that there is no reference to the giant being around until 1694. That means that somehow, either nobody noticed the giant on the side of the hill for nearly 700 years, or nobody thought it was an important enough thing to write down. Thanks to new technology, researchers managed to properly date the chalk used to draw the giant by taking samples and analyzing them with a technique known as optically stimulated luminescence. That's how they got the giant dated to around the 10th century. And as for the large naked god part, he was probably a depiction of a mysterious god named Helif, whom the ancient Anglo-Saxons in the region once worshipped. Horde of Japanese Scrolls In Japan, experts have made a startling discovery inside of a Buddhist statue. Researchers working with the Nara National University investigated 180 artifacts that were taken from inside a rather small statuette normally kept inside the Hokeji Temple in Nara, the ancient Japanese capital. Most of the artifacts are scrolls, with some found inside of the statue's body and some found inside its head. They seem to have been stashed inside the statue for safekeeping and then forgotten. Not even the main priest at the temple today had any idea the statue was hiding such interesting treasures. The temple was built back in the 8th century at a time when Buddhism was getting more popular in East Asia. At the time, Nara was a center for Buddhist activity. The statue is actually the figure of Monju Bosatsu, a kind of mythical person who didn't want to go to Nirvana and decided to stay on Earth to help humanity in their suffering. The statue is about 700 years old. The reason researchers were so suspicious of it is because back in those days, it was actually quite common to hide artifacts and scrolls inside of statues, and sometimes even mummified bodies. The team had to use CT scans to look deep inside the statue, at which point they saw the hollow space bursting with scrolls. But unfortunately, the scrolls haven't actually been taken out of the statue. Researchers can't figure out how the scrolls got into the statue in the first place, and they can't figure out how to get them out without breaking it. This means it's pretty unlikely that we'll ever know what was written on the scrolls, seeing as there appears to be no way to get them out. Yet. The Veil of Veronica 
The Veil of Veronica is one of the most mysterious and controversial relics ever discovered. The Veil begins with a legend. A woman named Veronica took pity on Jesus Christ as he was carrying the burden of his cross through the dusty streets of Jerusalem on his way to be crucified. The story goes that she stepped out of the crowd and wiped the sweat and blood from the face of Jesus with her veil. Jesus thanked her for being so kind, and the blood and sweat the sheet wiped off left a lasting imprint of his face on her veil. The cloth became sacred, and legend has it that the veil can even heal the sick. In 1999, it was announced that the veil of Veronica was found hidden inside of a monastery in Italy. At the time, people were surprised because they had thought the Catholic Church was holding onto the veil in the Vatican. After all, once a year, they used to bring the veil out of the Vatican and show it to everyone before putting it back in their secret vaults. The mystery here is finding out which veil is real, if either. Supposedly, the veil was taken by Emperor Tiberius after Jesus' death, then eventually passed down to Pope Clement, then down to the next pope, forever kept in the church. But Heinrich Pfeiffer, a professor at Gregorian University, says the veil in the Vatican is just a copy and the original vanished back in 1608. It was apparently stolen and then sold to the secluded Italian monastery up in the hills, where it wasn't seen again until 1999. Of course, nobody can actually prove any of this. Viking Woman's Grave The grave of a mysterious Viking woman was just discovered in Norway. It was in the Hesne and Heim municipality after archaeologists had already been digging for several weeks without finding anything. The only thing they had turned up all season were a couple of cooking pits, but that all changed when they came upon a dark layer of greasy soil, which often comes before the remains of a human body. It was a huge surprise to find the body, and even more shocking when it turned out to be the body of a Viking woman buried around 1,000 years ago. She was found inside of her own burial chamber, something very rare in ancient Norway. According to the project manager, Raymond Salvage, the deceased woman was put into the wooden chamber, a lid was placed on top, and she remained undisturbed until now. Researchers also discovered a small treasure trove of valuable beads, at least 340 of them to take with her into the afterlife. Nobody is sure what the beads represent, why this woman was given such an extraordinary burial, or just who exactly she was. Ancient Bark Shield An absolutely astonishing find was made in England, and it is the only one of its kind anywhere in Europe. The find involves a shield made from tree bark that dates back 2,300 years. Archaeologists say the shield was crafted between 395 and 250 BC. According to Julia Farley, the curator of the British and European Iron Age collections at the British Museum, the shield is a phenomenal object and one of the most important finds that she has ever encountered. The shield was first found by archaeologists digging near the River Soar. The reason the shield is so shocking is that it's made of bark. Organic objects very rarely survive the passing of time because they simply rot away, and usually quite quickly. But because the shield was found inside of a pit filled with water, it could have somehow been preserved by the special minerals in the river. What's even more shocking is that until now, nobody had thought bark shields were really used in Europe. Everyone thought bark shields would be too flimsy for battle. But new experiments show that creating a shield out of bark and wood may have been lighter than metal and tough enough to block most attacks. It's not clear just how widely used these shields really were, seeing as this is the only one of its kind ever found, but they could have been used a lot and it's just that all the examples have rotted away over the past 2,000 years. Thanks for watching! Which of these discoveries did you find the most fascinating? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button and come back again for more videos like these. See you next time! Bye!